Uh, it's a real honor to be here. Thank you all very much. Thank you for taking time out of your Thursday afternoon to come and participate today. Um, it's been a blast so far since yesterday and on to today, so I really appreciate the time that I've had with everybody here at Wisconsin. Um, I want to give a special shout out to Dr. Winkle Wagner for inviting me and to the Qualitative Minor Symposium series for putting um, talks like this together. I think it's a real luxury that I hope a lot of students and faculty are taking advantage of um, that you have going on here. So as we move forward, I'm just gonna take the first minute here to be silent and work through a few images just to, to throw them out there for you to consider. Thank you for entertaining that. So the title of my talk this afternoon is Critical Inquiry in the Anthropocene. So I'd like to welcome everybody to. <laughs> I will be bouncing back and forth between uh, my station here and walking around. Sometimes I need to, I think better through writing, so there's a lot of text that I'll be going back and forth from. Um, but uh, as a brief outline of what you have in store, um, I'll speak a little bit about this idea of the Anthropocene and, and give a little overview or outline as to how we might understand that to be. And then I'll move into, um, oh, as well as the Anthropocene's, what I consider its attendance, particularly its lead attendant, um, this, this, uh, this use, now we'll find fancy words later, uh, neoliberalism. So we'll have a, a small, brief moment about that as well. Um, we'll then move into talking about posthumanism as ontological retaliation to neoliberal governmentality. So who the heck knows what that could possibly <laughs> entail, but if you're along for the journey, I'm here too. And, uh, and then I'll try to wrap up by putting posthumanism to work uh, through some critical social research in the Anthropocene drawing largely from a few colleagues and friends of mine, as well as a, a project that I'm really in the weeds on right now, but um, feel really cool about sharing and, and perhaps even getting some back and forth on toward the end of the hour, if possible, hopefully. So um, thank you for that opportunity. Uh, Rochelle did encourage me to be as experimental as I would like um, and to bring in ideas that I'm thinking with, thinking through, rather than something that was just solidified and done. And so there's no need to expect that I will give you an answer on anything <laughs> related to critical inquiry or the Anthropocene. You can relieve yourselves of that expectation. <laughs> uh, I will put forward that this work is squarely situated in what some scholars have dubbed the ontological turn in qualitative inquiry. As such, any entanglements with current methodological practices are mercurial. It's like playing with mercury, where it's really shiny and, and shimmery and, and attractive and sexy, but very dangerous, right? And at the same time, could all collapse and dissolve away uh, much of the hard work that I've put in to the presentation today. I'm prepared for that. Um, luckily, uh, we're amongst a lot of really smart people here, so we won't fall through the earth and we'll be all right. Um, 
Anyway, so this mercurial nature, slippery, dangerous, exciting, desiring, and I would put forward responsibility laden. And hopefully we get to some of the ethics, the forms and ways of doing things um, toward the end of the talk today. Further, I will put forward this work generally takes uh, as a known and, pre and assumed precondition the neoliberal governmentality as originally outlined by Foucault in his lectures on the birth of biopolitics. I'll spend too brief of a time summarizing um, that work in the context of critical social inquiry in just a, a few moments, but I would love to further explore these themes and terms and ideas in relation to the rest of the talk later, either during discussion or if you're joining me for dinner or if you're around tomorrow and want to come to the graduate student lunch session, which will be really cool and most um, exciting for graduate students who I hope can make it. Um, <laughs> with free food. So. And before we really get going, I want to recognize the ongoing contributions to my, my thinking and doing in this, in this playful assemblage building uh, with this work from some really close colleagues who deserve a lot of recognition, including uh, Dr. Aaron Kuntz at the University of Alabama, uh, Dr. Arado Blanco Ramirez at UMass Boston, Gary Rhodes at University of Arizona, Judy Marquez Kiyama at my very own University of Denver, Paul Eaton, Dr. Paul Eaton, who was at uh, uh, Sam Houston State, Dr. Ben Baez at Florida International, Sam Anderson Lehman, who has the uh, audacity to work with me as a, as a grad assistant, Brenda Cifuentes, same condition, and Molly Sarubi, who escaped that um, disease and <laughs> slipped away over to Dr. Kiyama. Uh, the last three of whom are talented students in the higher ed department, MA and PhD programs at the University of Denver, and I invite you to look forward to relationships with them in the future as well. Uh, so now at this point, I'd like to invite you into becoming a mercurial assemblage of thought, experiment, materiality, alterity, and who knows what else we find along the way. So what is the Anthropocene? And I would put forward, we might experiment later on with an idea of an American Anthropocene in post-secondary education. We might not. In a scientific sense, the Anthropocene is our current geologic period, recognized as one in which humans are the primary agents of affect and effect on the planet. We have as much power over geologic change as anything else, if not more so. It is the geologic period in which humankind became a geologic force. Such science forces us to socially grapple with the consequences of human agency, not as separate from nature, but, con but constituent and simultaneously constituting of nature. Put more simply, we invent nature. With every decision we make, socially and politically, regarding how we choose to understand it. A blunt consequence here is that what we often consider human ecosystems or human ecologies, uh, the bedrock of much ecological theorizing and research in education today, could really simply be understood as ecosystems and ecologies, sans the human modifier. Um, this all sort of rests along a, a, tri, a, a, a tripartite understanding of life, our species, and, human, and humanity, wrapped up in the Greek idea of zoe, or zoe, or zoe, depending on how you prefer to pronounce it, which I would put forward we should understand as life itself, right? As well as bios or bios, which would be life in a communitarian sense, form of life, right? And then, uh, and then what has thus far been understood as the ultimate zoe, anthropos, which is the idea of the human, which perhaps contradictory to what we're taught in most intro methods courses is an idea rather than a precondition to the universe. Uh, where do we want to go there? The Anthropocene, as currently conceptualized by environmentalists, geologists, historians, and many social scientists, can be characterized by at least three distinctive characteristics of an ontological nature. 
it has been characterized as a post-natural post ontology. Now, post here does not necessarily mean after, nor does it necessarily mean next, but rather what is missing, or that which is missing. So by post-natural ontology, the ideas in, at stake here in terms of understanding what the Anthropocene can mean are, I'm sorry, hi, world. Focus more, I was told not to turn my back. <laughs> but the idea of a post-natural ontology is that nature is that human invention, right? So the natural world is that which we design it to be. The post-social ontology gets at the sense of in this uh, social, in the, in, that there's a continuum across the natural and the social, right? So neither necessarily presupposes the other, nor can be pre, a, a precondition to anthropos, to zoe, or to bios. And the post-political ontology is the sense that the Anthropocene has thus far been understood as nonpartisan, as strictly to be known, as, as uh, not having a political stake, but simply being as is. These are not uncontested, and I'm not putting forward that these are truths we should cling to, but these are characteristics of how Anthropocene has been understood thus far. Did it move? Oh, cool. So some social implications of the Anthropocene. If we're to think through the Anthropocene as an opportunity for critical social research, perhaps it's worth radicalizing this, po this idea of the post-natural. Perhaps we need to think as deeply and take as seriously as possible what a post-natural ontological uh, way of knowing could mean could be, could be practiced, could be understood. Uh, it highlights the social diversity and difference in the sense that <clears throat> rather than ascribing all zoe, all bios, to anthropos, right, that there might be multiple anthropi, you could think of that in, in terms of that, perhaps. Um, and it also, uh, most folks are saying, because the Anthropocene in the science literature has been understood as post-political or unpolitical, we actually, in critical social research, need to reintroduce the political to the Anthropocene. If we can accept Anthropocene as not just our geologic era, but perhaps our social era as well. Here is where I'd like to, to take a little sidestep into neoliberalism which, although terribly popular, is still very dangerous to, to try to talk about, which is why I'll refer back to my text here. So in here, I am fashioning my neoliberal understandings in the Foucauldian fantasies of the very real. So it's a, I understand neoliberalism as a very particularized form of governmentality, a governmentality of things deployed over and over and over again as the logic and goal of our quote-unquote age of humankind the Anthropocene, marked by four, and I mean, obviously there's a lot more going on here, but hyper-individualism, hyper-surveillance, economic determinations of productivity, and competitive entrepreneurialism, where we might think of hyper-individualism in terms of the supremacy of the individual and identity over the collective and or subjective where hyper-surveillance surveillance might be understood as the obsession with all things being known, not just watched, but that we can actually know all things, documented and signified as knowable through statistics and positively verifiable, where economic determinations of productivity <clears throat> suggest that only that with value in an economy only our things that can be configured economically can be understood as productive and desirable. In this sense, if our bodies can't contribute economically, we're not just useless, we are wrong. Competitive entrepreneurialism in this uh, uh, melu could be seen as on our own, we succeed or we fail. And on our own, we must succeed against one another, or else we fail. 
and on our own, our failure ensures others' success, which reinscribes our failure on our own. Yet, when we succeed, our success marks our bodies as innovative, exceptional, and valuable to the marketplace in which we are most suited. As a governmentality, then, neoliberalism transcends the art of governing. It is not a governance structure itself, nor a model for governments. As governmentality, neoliberalism does not organize or operationalize systems of control and political relations. Such a government could conceivably head off crises. Rather, as a governmentality, neoliberalism delineates what Foucault called the conduct of conducts. Neoliberalism makes certain truths possible, certain ways of knowing available, knowable, and ultimately, as my friend and colleague Aaron Kuntz has put it, makes a certain sense of sense. Common, makes a certain sense of sense commonsensical. So as a governmentality, then, neoliberalism builds a circus of possibility by refuting imminent planes of implausibilities. And now we return to the Anthropocene with three ontological becomings as the sort of possible multiple pathways uh, to best practice, which I will playfully engage with a little later, drawing on, on my friend Laura Smither's work. So all of our things, whether natural or plastic, share agency with us humans. Things matter. And things, created in our minds as subservient and only act in as much as we give them credence to be, in fact, are setting their own agendas. While perhaps, similarly to Bruno Latour's assertion that we have never been modern, we might now recognize that complicit with our neoliberal regime, we have never actually been human. That is, we have never fully actualized our humanness in the idea of the Vitruvian man. Back to the beginning but rather usurped ourselves into our current and possibly inevitable post-human necessities. Whether it be the sense of self we can only recognize through our online status updates, or the claims to personal wellness we can only make through the Fitbit techniques that we, invent, that we invite to become part of our bodies, our humanness can now can only emerge as far as it can be individually surveilled for its economic contribution to the competitive entrepreneurial esprit de corps, American Anthropocene and post-secondary education. The point here is that any critique of neoliberalism, particularly any critique of neoliberalism circulating within, without, and through post-secondary education, should recognize the post-human and non-anthropocentric necessity of social theory as we engage with science. For here, I believe, lies great promise. Posthumanist and, and, and non-anthropocentric ontological retaliation as academic activism ag against, oh, hang on, as academic activism might indeed afford some salvation for those who want to imagine anew the knowledge imperative for democratic purposes and emancipatory regimes of pluralistic truths. So now I'd like to transition into this, to, the, to a genealogy of post-humanist thought. It is going to be incomplete, it is going to be unsatisfactory, but I've listed here some of the key players in, uh, in contemporary post-humanism, some of the folks that I've drawn from and learned a lot through. And I would like to read a quote from Rosie Bredotti to get us moving here. Quote, Post-human theory is a generative tool to help us rethink the basic unit of reference for the human in the biogenetic age known as Anthropocene, the historical moment when the human has become a geological force capable of affecting all life, all zoe, on this planet, end quote. And I added the zoe part, that was me. All right, so what is posthumanism, right? <clears throat> in one sense, 
it is an answer or a response to the debates between humanism and anti-humanism. So we can summarize, and I'll, I'll talk about what the, some of those debates have been in a second, um, or right now. So these debates have been around, you know, the universalist posture of the humanist project, that the human can be u known universally, right? That, we, that anthropos can be known as a universal. Uh, the historical progress and of perfectibility. The humanist project, what most social science research today is grounded within, assumes this notion of being able to, that, that historical progress can reach some sort of perfectibility, that that should be a valuable goal for us, right? Uh, humanists and anti-humanists have struggled over what notions of autonomy can mean and or look like and or be practiced as. This relates to the self-determination debates, um, the politics of location and the situatedness of perhaps identity or knowledges, uh, dialectical otherness, progress v. providence. So while the humanist project was squarely uh, a, a secularist project, its notion of progress was directly imported from the religious notion of providence, right? So it never really made that divorce, right? Uh, truth, notions of truth, evidence, critique, critique as negative, critique as positive, uh, social research as positive, um, restrictive or productive, right? So post-humanism is not an abandonment of the humanist endeavor, nor a wholesale salute to anti-humanist concerns. And anti-humanism here, you think about things like post-structural theory and post-colonial theory. Those are who I'm referring to in terms of the anti-humanists, right? The folks trying to tear down the humanist project of positivism, constructivism, and critical theory. Um, <clears throat> so post-humanism then emerges less as a compromise and more as a generative, productive response to the humanist, anti-humanist controversies and critique. It seeks to break through the dialectical conceptualizations of humanness, providing innovation in ways to embrace the situatedness of our epistemological condition and the interreliance, interconnectedness of our ontological becoming. The debt to postcolonial theories here is real and must be recognized as the starting point for posthumanism as a starting point of posthumanism, where humanism in large part has been empirically demonstrated to have been used to declare and construct certain subjects as less than human. So the humanist endeavor, concomitant with the colonial endeavor, has been used as a tool to dehumanize, largely along biopolitical cartographies traced onto race, ethnicity, sexuality, gender, and social class. Another notion to help us understand posthumanism is its recognition of advanced capitalism and biotechnology, leading to what posthumanists would argue has been the commercialization of the planet. Right? And this relates to that post-natural ontology of the Anthropocene, where we can see today that everything has been made economical about how we know the natural and social worlds, the natural slash social, or the social hyphen natural. Right? So the culture-nature continuum has been <coughs> capitalized into our economic um, epistemological understandings. Does it move again? Oh, cool. Um, another notion behind posthumanism is this telethanatological machines. Uh, so that's huge word. That's really com like com like I have to look it up every time I, I I I try to read it. But basically, we're talking about how really good we have become at death how really good we have become at killing, how really good we have become at destruction in the name of survival. We destroy in order to sustain. 
we have perpetual war for perpetual peace. Roberto Esposito uses an example of the war in Afghanistan where bombers came in and simultaneously dropped bombs to destroy people while also dropping humanitarian aid to support the survival of people. Not just like in the same country, not the same nation state, the exact same coordinates at the exact same time. So we drop bombs to destroy Zo while dropping aid to sustain Zo. And that makes sense in today's world. That is possible in today's world. So that's where we're talking here about how, how good we are at killing each other. <clears throat> Post-human knowledge. So here is where the, the conditions, the empirical conditions that can be denoted through our investigations of the, of the planet, of the universe, of our experiences, of our practices, of the assemblage of our activity, moves into the knowledge imperative of, of, of academia, where post-human knowledge can see and understand and invent critique as creative. We do not simply deconstruct, but we take that deconstruction into the production of new concepts, of new ways of doing, and activism becomes active again. So those are two things that are extremely important in the post-human knowledge movement, that critique need not simply be negative, right? That we're not just uh, uh, tearing things apart, but we're actually building things back up together. All right, so now I'd like to transition into putting post-humanism to work, which I hope will help illustrate and elaborate a bit on how some of these crazy abstract ideas come to life in what we might consider a post-humanist ethics of critical inquiry. Where am I here? So first I'd like to draw on some work um, from Paul Eaton at Sam Houston State University. And his main interests really are looking at students in the digital age and how students um, in higher education, uh, uh, which he presumes is a process of humanization. He thinks that education and higher education in particular are institutions that were developed over time for the explicit process of becoming human. That they are tools used, social tools used in the humanist project of building anthropos, building and securing anthropos, right? So moving from Zoe to Bios to the anthropos. Uh, however, he's really fascinated by the fact that students are now all over the place with digital technologies and both producing and reflecting what we might consider identities through those digital technologies. Where post-humanist subjectivity, according to Eaton, thrives in the decentering of the humanist endeavor. So we need to decenter what higher education has been built to do. Moving beyond the fixity of social identities and identity politics. The fragments in relation as creative potential rather than the intersection of bounded social identities. He wants us to let go of these notions of social identities. Not that there isn't value in exploring them and, ex and, 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 and excavating those, but he recognizes that student identities are now distributed across multiple platforms and media and, and modes, whether it be how I know my wellness through my Fitbit and what posts that immediately might send to my Facebook, or what I, what I share on Instagram, or what I intentionally limit the temporality of through things like Snapchat. So is the picture I send you via Snapchat or send to the world, does that have the same weight as the picture I post on my Instagram which lives there forever, right? And if so, how could we ever know? And how might we weight these things? So Paul is really interested in exploring how the fragments that are generated through social media, and the media part there, the plurality is, is, is extremely important, how those in relation can be seen as creative potential rather than the intersection of bounded social identities. So it's an anti-intersectionality argument, to be very clear. It's not the layering on, it is the excavation of. 
So this is a radically situatedness of becoming, becoming animal, becoming earth, becoming machine, where assemblages of becoming are entangled across sentient and non-sentient interactive agents. I can't quite make sense of what Paul necessarily means through that, other than I think what he's getting at is that we move across as what Rosie Bredotti calls as nomads, across various liminal planes. And through those planes, which could be seen as through Facebook, I am known as something different. And then through Twitter, I am known as something different. And it changes myself ontologically. It changes what the self can be. It changes the anthropos. And now I'd like to move along from subjectivity into uh, post-humanist analysis. Uh, subjectivity, I, I like to focus on first, because it's sort of that like post version of identity, in a sense, right? And then now um, analysis is something that like critical researchers do, actually. And so here I'm drawing largely from, why didn't this move? Where am I now? Oh, okay, that works. Um, here I'd like to draw largely from Laura Smithers' work, who's at the University of Oregon, um, and she's interested in students in bridge programs in higher education, and how to uh, not just think about what's the best way to serve folks, but she deals with this idea um, on which path to best practice, and the multiple ontologies of students. So, when you think about that term, which path to best practice, and you really think about it, it's very strange. Because best practice should have a path, if it is the best, right? But, best pra but to think which path to best practice can honor these multiple ontologies that are operating at the same time. <laughs> Laura quotes Karen Barad saying, we are responsible for the world of which we are a part, not because it is an arbitrary construction of our choosing, but because reality is sedimented out of particular practices that we have a role in shaping and through which we are shaped. Laura asks, what are we making reality in practice to be? And in what ways can we make reality differently? She's rethinking the neoliberal student, providing us with what she calls a diffractive reading of students in transition, where students are read read through their, that activity, rather than reading on the activity. Um, and she thinks of students as ontologically multiple. To begin with, and she starts with what she calls secondly, that researchers are always beginning secondly, talking, taking over stories. We cannot escape the fact that we take over the stories of those whom with we, we work. And so to think about that is to begin with the, uh, is, is rather to begin with the achievement gap and not white supremacy, right? And that's the danger of acting secondly. Um, the to think of the decline of tenure as opposed to the subordination of all value systems to economic means of production. So post-humanism, Laura puts forward, as a flattened, modest system starts with practices, assemblages, entanglements. It is not mind or matter. It is not subject or object, but rather assemblage. And to measure within an assemblage is to enact boundaries. It's to create. We can never say that a student is. The student changes in each measurement not as a combination of multiple identities or experiences, but as inseparable from the assemblage, from each assemblage. And to be clear, I am quoting and paraphrasing very freely from Laura's work here. These are not my ideas. She moves on to talk about how can we then think through th ideas like resistance. And she's interested in looking at attributing resistance to persons, v individuals, that is humans, she suggests perhaps is to ignore the influence of matter, like cell phones, like tablets, other zoe, the bios, 
family backgrounds, etc. So she would like us to start somewhere else, secondly. Smithers wants to start with the N, the whole, the assemblage. She wants to subtract what is unique and map the folding in of her own boundary-making practices as the inquirer, as the researcher, marking bodies and representing the fluidity of lines around the constructed subject. This is a non-identitarian uh, notion of doing research on folks we might consider students in our everyday vernacular. So Smithers is interested in generating new kinds of questions, taking cues from Alicia Jackson and Lisa Mazai's thinking with theory in qualitative research. So she asks instead, how do remarks of some women work to produce resistance in a summer bridge program? How does technology use during discussion by participants in the room work to produce resistance? How does silence in discussion around monikers like queer versus gay work to produce resistance? These are not typical social science questions. These are questions that look at the assemblage, the activity as the unit. So from posthumanism, Smithers suggests that researchers get to create reality constituting boundaries conscientiously is the opportunity available to us. Next, I'd like to pivot to thinking about posthuman representation. And here I'm drawing from the work of Gerardo Blanco Lopez and Lisa Paluai from UMass Boston, who have been investigating college view books and the way that colleges and universities represent themselves through these view books, oftentimes online, right? Because the old school view book is apparently passe or just no longer used. <clears throat> its economic value has dissipated. Here I like to point out um, that they are thinking of humanism as an intellectual cause that they should rally against, that we can rally against, particularly <clears throat> leaving uh, from the departure point of post-colonial theory, which recognized the humanist project as the devaluing of particular bodies across the, across the globe, right? so that some of us can never actually achieve the status of anthropos. So Blanco Lopez is quick to build upon the post-colonial deconstructions of humanism and reconstructions of anti-humanism in recognizing that most of the bios across the globe have been subjected to practices and measurements intended to preclude us from membership with anthropos. That is, our social institutions, like higher ed, have been built to dehumanize people of color, sexualized minorities, Zoe with disability, and so on. As such, the development and progress project of humanism exacerbated exponentially in neoliberalism, makes evident that non-Vitruvian conforming bodies are not human. Therefore, they need human agency exercised upon them. In this sense, I want us to think about mansplaining or when white folks explain the experiences of black folks or how one straight white man empowered, quote unquote, a bunch of lesbians, fags, and other queers to get married despite his Catholic teachings from the bench on high. And here I'm talking about Justice Kennedy as the swing, the swing that I get to ride through, interp through until we change the laws again. Um, but what, uh, to get really deep into their project quickly, they're looking at how university branding is shaping, excuse me, how we can understand what, they, what, what Elizabeth St. Pierre has called the ruins, which is academia, right? So methodologically, Rarlo is, asked, is interviewing objects. And what he means by interviewing objects is he's asking himself, what do these objects say to me when I look at the view book? when I see who is there, when I see what activities those folks are engaging in, when I see the white professor with a whole bunch of students of color hanging out with them in the college view book, what is that actually saying back to Arardo in his situatedness with all of his uh, uh, history of participation within and without that institution, 
right? I don't want to speak for Erardo and how he hears those objects. Um, I'll direct you to his work in particular to find that out. But here we see the, the uh, explicit attention of non-human matter. The view book is not a person, right? The, the screen that I am listening to when I'm engaging with the view book or, or, or the, the university branding, right? That is not, uh, that is not human. That, so that's non-human matter that is acting actively with me or to me or against me, right? In shaping uh, what I can become. And that's what I really like about, about their work. So here is where, where it comes into where I'm playing around with this stuff. And I realize we're running a little short on time. Um, but I'm interested in what I'm calling the performative review of performance. And it's particularly stemming out of my own frustrations at how faculty are um, expected to produce for our performance reviews and how those happen annually, how they happen at no moments of tenure or promotion um, or, or mid-tenure reviews. Um, I'm talking about the annual review as an assemblage. So scholarship being overtly reduced to economic production, counting how many articles, books, chapters, presentations, grant submissions, grant awards, amount of our grant awards, over and over. Where the annual review, and this can take form in annual review forms, instructional load forms, where we have to fill out what am I teaching? How many credit hours is that? How does it relate to what my contract says? Position responsibility statements. Um, course buyouts, effort certifications when we have grants and contracts, as well as simply innocuously seeming things like faculty meeting minutes, where it's noted who was present and who was absent, or perhaps non-participatory in the bios of that meeting. So in my own um, case at the University of Denver, we enter our annual review uh, matter or data into an online system. This online system is called, let me find my real place here. It's called Activity Insight. Um, and I will refer back to Activity Insight in a moment. So that's why I want to make sure that you have that, that idea in there. Um, I'm going to jump ahead a bit. So if we think uh, up on the slide I have in the review as surveillance, right? So we know roughly what that, that annual review assemblage is composed of at this point, right? Like the entering of those particular kinds of information, right? So it's easy, perhaps, to use the notion of performance review as surveillance technology um, it might be a little too easy of an explanation because it's not terribly difficult to conceptualize the review of faculty performance as a situation of disciplinary power, right? The shaping of my individual body. Uh, the reviews are there in part to, to document what a professor has achieved. The act of supplying the review with my achievements simultaneously reminds me that I am expected to achieve and that these expectations are tied to my tenure, my promotion to full, my merit pay increases, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So the, yet, at the same time, the surveillance function of performance review could also be read as diffracted through the neoliberal condition of the academy to move beyond discipline, and in fact, as an effort to produce and sustain particular bios a particular form of life as a faculty in a communitarian sense. This diffraction is a post-human movement in explaining the situation, and it would inevitably emerge differently if I were situated as a woman, as Latino, as single, or as, pro or as professoring through a disability. As Smithers, and clearly she's drawing on a legion of theorists here, but as she demonstrated in her reading of diffractive analysis and post-human sensibility, the assemblage of the performance review creates the reality of neoliberal governmentality via the hyper-surveillance, economic means of production, and the entrepreneurial investment of the individual in it, thus enabling or activating the biopolitical situation in which certain modes of professoring 
become the new version of the Vitruvian man. So we could throw up a slide of a Vitruvian professor. So I want to get a bit more concrete in the few minutes that we've got left in the hour. What I've been referring to as the performance review assemblage includes things, things like my CV, my computer, my data management system software that I use to enter my accomplishments, that fun uh, um, name, Activity Insight, right? Like, who could disagree with Activity Insight? Um, uh, it also includes, this assemblage includes me. It includes the report generated by my inputs and the engagement with that output by my department chair. So inputs to Activity Insight do not capture very many qualities of my accomplishments. Right? It's designed as simple exchanges of capital within a monetary system that values certain categories of achievements, the peer-reviewed journal article, over others, the book chapter that appears in a friend's edited volume. My chair must engage in that output as if it is me, or rather, as if it is, because it becomes. I am now my activity insight output. My chair will make recommendations about me based on that output that is me and attach them to her section of the activities insight. I, Ryan Evely, as a professor, am now beyond me, beyond my activity insight report. I am me plus my report plus my chair's report minus me, or at least minus my body, minus my theoretical contributions, minus my influence on the field as circulated through the findings in my research reports, minus my shocks to thought that I worked so hard to figure out and explain tediously in the presentation I gave with my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Rochelle Winkle-Wagner, during that kick-ass symposium on life story research at AERA four years ago. I am my activity insight report. It, a thing, is. Full stop. This thing is self-organizing. It may or may not be what we consider conscious, but it organizes itself. It moves itself through the interweb of fiber optics to circulate across and throughout the institution. It, dare I say, has a personality, perhaps. It's feisty. It might even be considered to be endowed with, or, or rather to produce through its own line of flight, zo, that is, life. And the biopolitical turn, the line of flight for activity insight as Zoe to Bios sans Anthropos jumps into a neoliberal governmentality through which professoring becomes about the productivity and not about the knowledge imperative. Or rather, the knowledge imperative of professoring becomes the performance review of productivity and can be marked and illustrated when our individual performance reviews are amalgamated and subjected to institutional level analyses, as well as used for intra and inter-institutional comparisons. How the social sciences are productive versus education, versus engineering, versus et cetera, et cetera. We move beyond the disciplining of bodies, the individual professor professoring, and into the situation where the bios is politically produced as a productive faculty in a communitarian sense. It's productive. This is not negative. Over and over, annual review, instructional load forms, position responsibility statements, course buyouts, effort certification, faculty meeting minutes. Me, other faculty, the software, the keyboard, the screen, the output. 
This could lead to new questions that could be generative for research on the knowledge imperative, which is my new fascination in my own research agenda. How does annual review produce resistance to neoliberal higher education? How does the computer I use produce resistance to neoliberal higher education? How does annual review produce new forms of scholarship? How do the resistances produced through annual review produce new assemblages of power knowledge? For when the review is born, my scholarship is born anew. The personality of my scholarship. I am no longer my work. My work is no longer me. I am only my work. My work consumes me. So in my notes now, I have wrap up somehow. <laughs> but what I'd like to do is simply invite you to engage with the Anthropocene and its social implications for critical inquiry with me. And I really would love it. And I know this has not been the clearest or most concise, necessarily even cogent discussion of posthumanist thought and ethics in, in ways of doing critical inquiry, but I hope it's at least provided a, a little bit here and there of like, oh, we could think differently about what an identity could mean or be or become. Um, and move beyond identity is, would be a, a bigger goal, broader objective. Thank you. And I know Rochelle has to leave, but I can stick around if folks don't have places to run to if we want to like chat a bit. One, one question I have, and I'm going to run out as you answer it, but how do you reconcile the critical with the post human? Like, how are you thinking about that? So I, I'm one of those folks that I don't want to say that it's replacing it something, um, but maybe responding and answering to, to strengthen. Like I, I would still say that posthumanist is, is a critical inquiry, right? Um, but it's, it's leaving behind the notion that, um, that, critical, that like critical theory, like the, in a normative sense, is, is trying to find just the better truth or trying to find a um, located truth that can't actually be known, right? That, that posthumanism from a, a, a power knowledge type of perspective, right? It's attack on critical theory or critical inquiry then would say, but I'm the one who's designing how that truth can become, right? Whereas I think in critical inquiry, we're still thinking that we are finding something natural, that we are still finding something that is in the real, right? So, and it's by no means saying this is the only way to do stuff. It's saying this is another way of doing things that might be assistive or supportive in combating that the dehumanization that so much of the humanist project brought about, but yet the anti-humanist projects have failed to um, replace. But they're good at identifying, not necessarily so good at doing things about. So I have a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I've heard you use the word thing as both what is it can you talk a little bit about thingness? Mm. And how do I know when something's a thing? Or I can try. I'm fascinated by things. <laughs> so Jane Bennett has this book called Thing Power, or, Ma or Thing Matter. Thing, I think it's Thing. She's talking about Thing Power. I don't know if that's the title of the book. But it's sort of like that this plastic thing, right, can actually exert agency, right? And I'm fascinated to, to play around with that and to think about that. And it helps, I think, in having a, le like, legitimizing how we can do analyses that pay attention to where are people located in the room and how does that encumber and or, or, or uh, uh, enthuse uh, various acts of resistance or, or action, right? So when is something a thing? When is it not a thing? When we design it as such is the short answer, but it's, it's not that this exists whether, this is here. In my inquiry practices, I have to decide if it's here, right? I get to decide if it's here. 
And I get to decide if I'm going to pay attention to it as an actant in what's happening here. So neoliberalism is only thing because we've just identified it as Yes, but we've sedimented it into our ways of knowing because of all the policies and practices and institutions that we've built up and up and up and up and up. But I think it's a governmentality of things. It things all of us and every, it, it flattens in a sense, right? Like, because it reduces its whole Oh, this is going to sound so weird. And I, I don't know if I'm right here. But its entire currency, to sample on the dependent variable, <laughs> is, is that it flattens us all into, mo into money or into a monetary system. Right? It flattens anything into a, flatten, into a, a monetary system. So it, neoliberalism thing, turns, it things all of us. If I can turn a noun into a verb. So whether or not something's a thing, I don't know about this suit either. It always has to be a collective commitment to it or a collective understanding of in order to be a thing it doesn't have to be experienced by more than one person. I mean I can I just decide whether or not something's a thing or not. Maybe it's a thing to me, but not a thing to everybody, but for it to be I don't know. Is there a collective thing? I, I'd have to read Bennett's stuff more carefully, I think. I don't know. How do we invest things as things? Social. Cohesion around that? Cohesion around them in order to be yeah. nice. I don't know if they need it. I think that that's in part what we do or what we've done, right? We've decided what things are and what things matter and differentially, right? And in part, large, and that, I think, so this is actually exciting to me now. I mean, it was before too, but now I'm getting percolated. That is like the post-humanist turn in that um, we have reified this the, the anthropos, the human, as the ultimate thing, right? As the thing to control all things. And we see that in the Anthropocene, right? Um, that, is, that is relevantly and evidently there. So the humanist project would put forward that we're the only thing that's not a thing, but all other matter are things, right? And so the post-humanist project is trying to argue, like, what if we sort of rejoin thingdom and recognize that whether we've, quote unquote, invented the chair or whether the butterfly flutters past us, as we engage in, in our geologic force on the planet, like, we are also things. And, and the chair and the butterfly are things as well. Now, not everybody working in the air and like the post humanist stuff is so enamored by, by um, plastic stuff, right? A lot of folks are saying, no, 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 that's there. That's, that's, we built that. Um, and we don't have to pay as much attention to the thing power of non natural stuff. Um, but uh, I think a lot of folks are paying attention to, to things. And then um, the machinic, I didn't really touch on the machinic analyses and stuff, but like um, a lot of people have been sort of reviving uh, Deleuze and Guattari's work on machines. And the notion here is that um, machines are very real and machines are, ha exhibit agency or an act agency over the planet and over us, um, or not necessarily over in a domination type of sense, but on us. Um, and, and they're not talking about metaphorical machines. They're talking about like, when I'm entering my inputs onto Activity Insight, I am part of a machine. And it is a very real machine that is producing all that other stuff and changing the knowledge imperative of American higher ed, right? So I am, a, I am a cog in the machine, but not in a metaphorical sense, in a very lived corporal reality of the machine. But I find that to be kind of fruitful and, and inviting and exciting to try to think through how could I exploit that in a research project.
Yeah. Do. Yeah. So there's a resistance that becomes available there. There are consequences, but there's consequences to all resistances, right? So I might not get my merit pay increase. My college of ed will look slightly less good than it might look if I did put my stuff in, right? Um, and on and on. Yeah? Um, beginning of your presentation, I thought, I, I kind of was immediately directed to thinking about the Earth and how humans have kind of used the Earth for our own needs mm -hmm. without really consideration of what the Earth's needs are. Yeah. And I was thinking about what, do you have any imaginations of what kind of um, environmental activism kind of inquiry in like a post-humanistic mindset would look like? You know, like how could we use that for, for that sort of work? Environmentalists have really been at the forefront of, of a lot of this work. Um, and while they politicize, the, so what's interesting, so we in the like sort of general population think of environmentalism as an overtly political arena right now, but environmentalist movements have sought really hard to depoliticize. So that's where a lot of critical, th critical researchers have been pushing back. And that's the whole notion of like, we need to radicalize the post-natural and, and um, bring back the, the political into the Anthropocene. <clears throat> because, um, you know, environmental policy isn't going to be passed without bipartisan support. So they try to depoliticize it. And a lot of the climate science stuff has been trying to show just, look, it's science that shows this. It's not, it's not a left-wing thing. It's not a right-wing thing. It's a thing. It's, it's a truth with a capital T, right? Um, <clears throat> so I think environmentalists are, are thriving in this arena, and they could go even fur thrive even further if they repoliticize the work, not along partisan lines, but in terms of recognizing that like the body politic is affect is affected through the environment, right? That we are concomitantly um, incumbent to the environment. That we are uh, not. It's going beyond just being part of the environment, but we're constitutive of the environment, right? So those are uh, just a few musings, but I think, what I think would be cool, and I had never imagined myself like getting into like sustainability studies. Um, it was always for me like I try to recycle kind of a, an idea. But now I feel, I think, like, I think maybe like folks in sustainability studies had a lot going on that I should be paying attention to in in real sort of analytical contributions to thinking through um, how our bodies and our structures and our processes are, are entangled together. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> and tomorrow for anybody, like the grad student session tomorrow is actually open to everybody I hear. It's gonna be far more workshoppy than talk talky. Um, so I think we'll have a lot of fun. And, um, and it will be much more concrete than today's discussion, presentation. Um, like we're just gonna be doing some fun things together. It's at noon. And free lunch. So tell all your friends I'm fun. I'm friendly. What was that? Can I ask you one more question? Please. So when you were explaining about those humanism and non-human anti-humanism, you explained something like the pro the notion of progress came mm -hmm. from those the religious discourse about providence. Yeah. Can you explain further about that? A little bit. Um, so uh, the Humanist Project was really, in many ways, a response against um, purely theologic notions of the world, right? So prior to the Humanist Project, we just ascribed all meaning to the priests. Like they were the only ones who, and, and we had this, humanism can also be read as anti-transcendentalism in that sense is what I'm trying to say. Secularism, you're saying? Yeah, and it's built on secularism. Or the Humanist Project is built on secularism. 
but this notion of progress in the humanist project. Um, some folks have done nice sort of philosophical and historical analyses to show that it basically is importing the idea of providence from uh, sectarianism into the humanist project. In a sense, like progress and providence are the same thing. They just renamed it and slightly repackaged it to make it fit politically with what they were retaliating against. I see. So, if I understand that there is like human progress, is, is another way of like theological understanding about well being or. So, it's so like post structuralists pointed to the notion of progress in humanist thoughts as. Um, we would call it progress, like we're always moving forward to something better. We can always be working to perfect um, the species. We can always perfect humankind. And that that is actually synonymous with the notion of providence and that we have a right to, these, to this perfection. We have a divine, we are divinely made and inspired, right? So it's that transcendental move of sectarianism that the humanist project claimed it was operating against, but actually just imported at least this one notion directly from, without ever reconciling that we can't explain why we think in terms of historical progress. We can't, we can't identify the, the situated activities that actually build that as a thing. And who's to say that what we're doing today is actually better than what we were doing 500 years ago, right? You know, the, the, the life forms on the planet 500 years ago, we don't know if they struggled with happiness and depression. We don't know if they were just sublimely surreal, right? Or if they were like dark and twisty, you know? Like were they all Grey's Anatomy'd up the whole time? Because we certainly seem to be. So much so that we fetishize like the dark and twisty, you know? Like we, we get off on like surveilling the Kardashian, the, we get off on the Kardashians' desire to surveil themselves through our eyes, right? So, but who's, like, so it's kind of audacious to suggest that that is progress from when people sat around a, a, a fire pit and exchanged loving stories about their ancestors. You know, they might have been a little colder when the fire went out than I am when, I'm, when I can automate my thermostat, right? But does that actually mean that I am a better human today than my ancestors were 500 years ago? We can't answer that question. Yet the humanist project just assumes yes, right? And that, the post-structuralists would argue, is, is the same thing as the notion of providence in sectarian transcendentalism. Um, saying like, you know, we're owed these things and therefore we are better for them and we are better because we deserve these things and we are the embodiment of betterment, divinely, right? So, yeah, does that help? So, I wrestle with this stuff all the time. Like this is not a known stuff by any stretch, right? <laughs> And, and it's like, woo, and I'm so afraid. I'm glad that this video is only available to Wisconsin folk because I'm really deathly afraid of what like Paul and Laura and Arado and Lisa will think of my paraphrasing and, and quoting of them very freely back and forth um, and how I packaged all of that together. I mean, they're very kind and generous. They, they know that I'm doing this today and they sent me all, their, we did a symposium together recently. So they shared all their papers with me to just pull from, but. I'd still be deathly afraid of what, like, I walk out and Paul would be like, you got that so wrong, you're such an idiot, you know? And, and so, but yeah, thank you everybody.